So I grew up in Queens. Uh, it was a predominantly uh, Italian neighborhood. Uh, a, blue, a lot of blue collar workers. In the neighborhood where I grew up, uh, your father either owned a business or you became a cop, a fireman, or a gangster, or somewhere in between. My both parents were correction officers. They worked on Rikers Island. Uh, Rikers Island was known as a very tough place uh, near Astoria, Queens. It was uh, by Hazen Street. It's uh, a lot of uh, criminals were there. Uh, my father would come with a lot of stories. Uh, my mom worked with the adolescents, which is the, one of the worst to work with. Um, I uh, did have a sister. She passed away when I was young. Uh, so I became the only child. Growing up, I uh, went to school. I played a lot of sports, got involved in a lot of sports. Uh, I didn't really want to become a cop. It's not what was on my agenda. It was I was going to play sports or do something in medicine. So as time went on, coming from Catholic school, uh, playing sports, uh, growing up around the guys, I knew a lot of the guys from the neighborhood, uh, a lot of knock around guys, um, hung out in the street a lot, played ball, tried to keep my nose clean. I uh, wound up going to college with St. John's University where I started studying pharmacy. At that point, I'd sit in class, I'd stare out, and uh, couldn't really just, couldn't get into it. I said, these people around, they, they ain't like me, you know? I had a little something different. Uh, had that edge, always had an edge to me, always had to be different, do something different. And uh, I wound up taking a police test, I remember, and it was the Nassau County Police Test in Long Island. Some of the highest paid cops in the country, at that time making six figures. I didn't know, people said the six figure boys. I didn't know what that was. I just said, okay. So I remember, I forgot about it. I would uh, be going to school. I'd be working some jobs, bouncing, uh, hanging out with the guys in the neighborhood. Uh, my father said, you know, stay away from certain guys. You know, I tried to listen. So I got a letter one day in the mail. It was from the uh, Civil Service, Nassau County Police. And my father always was, uh, always hard on me, always meant well. And I see my, my grade was like a 99.8 on this Nassau test. I said, Dad, 99.8? I says, it's like, I think, I'm, I think I'm ranked like 90 out of uh, 15,000 people that took it. He goes, yeah, you're probably 90 from the bottom, you idiot. I said, 90, 90 from the bottom, maybe you're right. So as time goes by, I didn't have a cell phone at the time. The investigator calls the house, I start the process. I'm in school, uh, I'm still at St. John's, and they tell me they're gonna put a class in. So they said, walked out of school that day, told my mom and grandmother, you know, typical Italian family, they started crying, making the sign of the cross, uh, praying, you know, why are you doing this, why are you doing this? But uh, something I wanted to do, you know. Went through the academy, really liked it, met a great bunch of guys. I was sold to this dream, like, you know, I'm gonna go out there, I'm gonna make a difference, um, make money, uh, you know, you get out there, you have the uniform. And uh, in Nassau, you know, it's like baptism by fire. They throw your keys to a car, you, and you go out on your own. And I was out there, I loved it. Um, it's, you know, that when you're a kid, I was a young kid coming out, I was 23 years old. I, uh, you know, worked out as a big kid. So, you know, you have a bit of an ego, uh, but you try to learn the job, you try to do your best. So I got into making uh, arrests, got into making a lot of DWI arrests, which everybody was rah, rah, rah in the beginning. And then as time went by, I noticed guys started to pull away from me. The more arrests I'd make, They'd give you awards on one hand, but other guys would just pull away from you. I couldn't figure what was going on. I said, you know, I come home, Dad, I'm doing a great job here. You know, I'm making arrests. But a lot of guys, you know, I'm getting a lot of flack. They're starting these rumors, they're making stuff up. He goes, well, you know, you gotta go with the program a little. You gotta back off a little. I said, but I'm doing my job. I thought you are out there, I'm stopping drunk drivers, I'm stopping them from killing people. Well, I'd get these things, I'd get PPA cards, the people were drunk, try to hand them to you. And, you know, I remember going to a few accident calls when I first was on the job. And I'll never forget one, it was a young girl. Uh, it was near one of the holidays and she, uh, she was killed by a drunk driver. So it really hit home to me in a certain way when I thought about it. And um, I'm like, you know, this is, it's, a, it's a crime that it shouldn't happen. So I, I was even more aggressive locking the drunks up. And the more people I locked up, especially influential people who became restaurant owners, or if they're related to a cop, I got a lot of slack and a lot of flack back. Um, I was making really good money at the time, working hard. And now I started, uh, as time went on, I said, you know, I'm gonna do my 20 years and I'll be out of here. But towards the end of my career, I started you know, doing a little more. And it comes one night, I pulled over someone and it turns out it was a cop's mom. She was intoxicated. I did the car stop, uh, wound up arresting her. At that point, it didn't go well. Uh, for me after that, she uh, 
you know, the son got involved. He was a, he was a cop somewhere. And, um, you know, I can't blame the woman, but it is what it is. It turned into this big fiasco where the whole department basically started to turn on me. You know, a lot of people, especially the higher ups with the commissioner on, started to say, oh, it was a false arrest. It was this, it was that. It wasn't a false arrest. You can nitpick anything and, you know, pull it apart, but it wasn't a false arrest. So at that point, I was like, you know what? I don't really need this. I'm not going to be harassed. My name dragged through the mud. So my point is like that one little thing they make into a huge thing. It's like they want you to make arrests, but they really don't want you to make arrests of certain people. If it's a restaurant owner, if it's, uh, you know, somebody influential, they really don't want it done unless it's a bad accident. So I would, uh, I looked at that. I was like, you know what? This is crazy. And a lot of people, when they look at police work, a lot of people say, a lot of cops, it's a black and white thing. It's a black and white thing. People, I've never won, no cop ever came across them and said, I'm going to pull over a black guy tonight. I'm going to arrest the black guy. Most cops, to be honest, most cops look for a thing called a no-hitter. A no-hitter is basically you have no calls that night. That's, that's a great night for a cop. I was aggressive. I was, you know, I was out there. But most cops are looking for that. The upper echelon where, where some of the corruption is, they want you to look at that black and white thing and keep looking at it. You know, it's to, it's to uh, distract you from really what's going on. I mean, we'd had guys on our job that were, you know, did things and they stayed on the job for, for crimes. And other guys that, you know, did a little thing and they were off the job. So it, it depends on that. And I would never, I'm not denouncing any police officer because the guys in patrol have it so tough out there. I respect them 100%. It's the guys that get far removed from patrol is where the problem becomes. When you're so far removed, you forgot when you were a cop. You just deal with paperwork all day. You forget that guy on patrol. Those patrol guys out there, it's, it's very hard for them to be out there, you know? And um, when I left the job, the job instills in your head, this is it. If you lose this job, if you leave here, you'll never get any other job. You'll never do anything. But when I left, I, there was a whole other career out there for me of business opportunities, money to make. Um, it just opened my mind a lot more, you know? And honestly, today, the way policing is, it... It's hard to change. If I, I don't have any children, but if I had a child, I wouldn't want to be a cop today. Not in the climate it is. Um, it's a very, very rough climate out there. The up echelon a lot of times do not have you back anymore, um, whether right or wrong. Um, I believe in a, a lawful society. I believe in one that, you know, you have to uphold the law. But um, we also got to be kept in check also. Our upper, upper echelon has to be kept in check. Do you regret anything you did while you were a cop? I, the only thing I regret, I probably should have made more arrests. That's what I regret, that I would have made more arrests. Um, that, that's really it. I have no other regrets because it made me who I am. Being on the job made me who I am. It molded me a lot. I made a lot of good friends on that job that, you know, stuck with me through a lot of things. You know, I've been through a lot in my life and I did make a lot of good friends on that job. It's definitely what did they say, um, I was watching a movie once, and they said it was the greatest show on earth is being a cop. And that's the truth. Because it, I don't know if it was, uh, what movie it was, I can't recall. But I remember, uh, it's like, you know, even when I was a little kid, you'd see a police car, and you see a crowd, and everybody looked towards that cop, like he had the answer. Like he was the guy. And then that fascinated me always. That's the point that did fascinate me about police work. It's like, no matter what, you know, you walk into somewhere with that uniform, you go to a call, people are looking for you. And that's why it takes a certain type of person. You know, you can't be the, I remember I was in the academy. It's a funny, quick story. Um, instructor's talking, he goes, hey, he goes, all right, you call to uh, a place, I forgot what he says, uh, call to a place, a uh, guy has a knife, he's uh, holding a woman, give this whole scenario. Guy in the front raises his hand, he goes, what do you do? I call 911 immediately. This instructor goes crazy. He goes, you are 911, you fucking moron. You know, so it's things like that. You know, there's stories for the job I could go, and people would not believe what, what happened. Um, a real, uh, another quick story is, uh, I was on patrol one night. I pulled into the spot, it's off, of, off the LA. The Long Island Expressway, familiar with New York, it runs east and, east and west. I pulled in, I would usually eat my food um, at this spot off New Hyde Park Road. I pull in and uh, I see a car there. And it was a, it was a spot where maybe Guy and girl would go to mess around, screw around. So I go in, I put the lights on, because I'm not going to bother them. I just want them to get out of there so I could eat and relax. The, uh, put the lights on, car doesn't move. i never forget, it was like a sob, old school sob. Put the lights on again, car doesn't move. It's all right. 
Now I'll get you out of here. I pull up to the car, go around the driver's side, take my flashlight, I see it. It's a gentleman alone, he's got his pants down, and he's having, basically has his dick in a chicken that you buy from Pathmark and going to town on the thing. I'm like, yo, what are you doing? He's like, nothing, nothing. He drops it. He's like, get out of the car. So I get him out. What are you doing? He's like, oh, yeah, nothing, nothing, nothing. I said, listen. I'm like, you know, I'm going to lock you up. Then I'm like, I can't lock this guy up. I'll be a laughing stock in the report. So I'm like, uh, you know, what, did, what are you doing? Tell me the truth. He's like, my wife, she's sick. I don't want to go to a prostitute. This feels like a woman. So now my boy, I'm like, you sick fuck. I'm like, take the fucking chicken and get out of here, you know? So I, I leave. I say, I got to tell somebody. I call the guy I work with. I say, come down here. I tell him, yeah, you're full of shit. You're full of shit. How this shit happen to you? It was like the weirdest shit would happen to me. Wherever I went, stuff would happen. It was the strangest shit. I had a, a woman one time, she's, uh, I get there, they're, they're fighting on the lawn. And at night in Long Island, you know, it's, uh, it's quiet. The part of the, the priest I was working at the time. And I hear, you hear like uh, the radio go off, you know, respond for a domestic. Nobody really wants to go. You get two cars aside. So all of a sudden I pull up, there's a naked woman on the lawn. I'm like, be advised to have a naked female. All of a sudden it's like, everybody's responding. So I got this woman on the lawn, she's swinging this thing at the guy, swinging at her husband, we separate him. It's a dildo. So what are you guys doing? She's like, it's masturbation night, and he was late when he came here. I said, masturbation night? What's wrong with these people out here? I came from Queens, what's wrong with them? So we, you know, I take him, we separate him, go into the house. She goes, officer, do I look fat? I'm like, no, you don't look fat at all. Thank you. She's like, all of a sudden she says the magic word, she wants to kill herself. I'm like, you gotta be kidding. Now we gotta go to the medical center, strap her on the trundle with the ambulance, and uh, I'm like, what, what happened here? I talk to the husband, very nice guy. He's like, ah, oh, she's got mental problems. You know, I was supposed to come home early. It was a masturbation night. The therapist said, and uh, she got mad and hit me with the dildo. So I'm like, this is ridiculous. Anyway, we bring her out to the ambulance. We have a new rookie working with us. He's like, oh, what do you want me to do? Do I drive the ambulance? I said, no, grab, grab the dildo, bag it for evidence. You know, joking around. So, we, you know, I forget about it. We go to the hospital, do a report. We finish up at the hospital. My lieutenant, they get us on the radio. You gotta be kidding. Come in here. I said, yeah, what's up? Why is this kid bringing a dildo in here with evidence? For Are you kidding? It's in the locker. Is something wrong with you? I said, something wrong with me. No, it was a joke. It's not a fucking joke. He's like, you guys fuck around too much. So that part of the job we play around, I mean, we just, uh, just funny, funny stuff we do. Do you bring it home to your family, to your wife? Um, no, you know, at the time, you know, it's hard. Like when I dealt with kids, um, a kid that died, we had, I dealt with things like that. It's very hard, you know. A kid or an, me, for me, seeing a kid or an animal die, is uh, it's horrible, you know, it's just horrible. So what it is, a lot of cops, and um, they'll, they'll say, they'll make humor out of a lot of things because not to go crazy, basically, because you start bringing that home with you and you don't laugh about it. You know, you don't, you don't have any, not humorous, but you got to find a lighter side of it. Otherwise, if you keep on bottling that up and bring it up, which a lot of cops do, and eventually, you know, lead to um, alcoholism and stuff like that, you know, if that's what happens, and it's, it's, it's sad, because a lot of guys, especially to work in, you know, I worked in a good part of Long Island, we were busy, I had a lot of calls, I got involved in a lot of stuff. Uh, but, you know, obviously, you're exposed to more when you work in the city, you work in, in the ghetto areas. I mean, crime can happen anywhere, but, uh, you know, I was very fortunate, you know, I, I made a very good living at it, of what I did. Um, I was very fortunate to have what I have. Uh, I was very fortunate to have the experiences I had, um, you know. The experiences go on and on. The stories, the, the stories go on and on. They'll last me for life. It's, it's funny. I go down to uh, Mar-a-Lago. I go a lot. And I deal with different business stuff. I deal with a lot of higher end, higher end people. And, uh, you know, I'm, I was just a cop. That's all I was. I had no big business background. But it's funny. You sit at tables with people that, you know, CEOs of companies and all this stuff. And all they want to hear, they don't want to hear from the CEO of another company. Hey, what, what happened when you were a cop? You ever hear this? You ever do this? Or... You know, the stories go uh, endless. Nobody has stories like this. You can run a Fortune 500 company for 20 years, you'll never get a story of like being a cop for one week. And it's just amazing the stories you have. And you tell people and people are like, no, that can't be. You gotta be making that up. I mean, it's just endless. And it, it's a life experience and, and you know, it's something I loved. It's terrible the way it ended for me. How many years you know? were you a cop? I did a little over 20 years in New York. And um, you know, I, it was, it was fun in the beginning. It was, it was a lot different 20 years ago when I got on. So in the end, you got forced out? In the end, I retired on my own. I decided, you know what, I'm, I'm gonna, I saw the writing on the wall, saw where it was going, and I see now the writing on the wall, where it went, and I'm, I'm glad I got out, actually, and they actually, in the long run, they did me a favor. 
You know, when everything that happened, they say everything happens for a reason. And it absolutely, because I, I enjoy my life more, I got into better, bigger business opportunities with people. Um, you know, and I, I always stayed, I didn't just, my thing was, I didn't stay with a lot of cops. I wasn't a rah, rah, go out and drink guy. I stayed with guys I, I grew up with, you know, even today, like I stay with guys, if you know, Johnny A. Light, very good friend of mine, uh, Mike Dowd, a uh, good friend of mine, Larry Mazza. Just guys, you know, with from different backgrounds, but it's just, you know, with guys that, that, that family oriented guys, you know, and we get along and people don't like, you know, a lot of times who I stay with, oh, you're a cop, you stay with these guys? I don't care, you know, a lot of these guys would after me in hard times in my life. And that's what I look at. I don't look at what you did. I don't look at the person you people say you are. I look at how you treated me. That's the main thing. And, and you stay by my side. So, you know, I just, you know, I hold my friends tr uh, true and close to me. And um, that's the way I live my life. It's a short life we have. You know, you have to enjoy every minute of it. And, um, you know, I'm here. I, if it's, my story could help a cop out there. You know, don't think, if like, you're having a problem at the end of your career, don't think it's over. Uh, don't look to alcohol. Don't look to the barrel of a gun. Don't look to none of that. Suicide's not the answer. Alcohol's not the answer. You could reach out to me if you want. Um, I'll talk to you, but uh, it's not the end. It's not the end. Don't let these jobs put you in a position where your life is over. And don't make the job your life. Always have something else. That's the best advice I can give to a young guy getting on also. You know, have something else. All right. Mike, thank you so much for sharing your story. You're welcome. Fascinating. Good luck with everything. For thank me. you. Thank you, man.